So I'm John Zumbrennan from the Political Science Department. I teach courses um, specifically in the field of political theory. So most of my work with students is trying to get them to read old, um, oftentimes quite challenging primary texts in the history of political thought or political philosophy. And my number one goal really is to get them familiarity with the text, but especially to get them talking about the text with one another. And that's the context in which I'll be talking about um, online discussions and using the online discussion tool in Canvas in particular. By way of uh, preface, I would say that up until a couple years ago, I was, like I think a lot of people are, a real skeptic of the value of online discussions, um, having never had a particularly good experience myself. Um, with that format. What changed uh, my mind was going through the Teach Online at UW workshops um, and being forced to participate in an online weekly reflection that was well structured and felt like it had a purpose and felt like it mattered to the overall experience. Uh, and so once I had that experience, um, then I started thinking about how I could use online discussions first in an online class introduction to political thought that I taught each of the last two summers and will be teaching again this summer. Um, and then this past term, and this is the course I'm going to talk about <coughs> most today, I've been using online discussions every week in a traditional face-to-face -face course called Democratic Ideas. So I'm going to talk mostly about what I've done this term in that Democratic Ideas course. I'll touch a little bit at the end on um, what I do in the online, the purely online introduction to political thought class because that one requires, I think, just a little bit different strategy because I don't ever see the students face to face. But the big things I'm going to emphasize are um, taking care with structuring the prompts for online discussion. Um, I want to talk about making sure that students know you're actually looking at the online discussion, but thinking about how you can convey that to students in a way that doesn't overwhelm you um, in terms of time spent reading and especially responding to discussion posts. Um, and then a bit about uh, just making sure that those online discussions do seem to serve a real purpose in the class. So I'm going to jump into my Democratic Ideas class on Canvas here in a minute. I want to show you a little bit about the overall learning outcomes for the course and talk about why I turned to online discussions. Then I'll walk through um, a few of the online weekly discussions we've done to try to pull out some points. And then, as I said, I'll jump into my um, intro to political thought at the end. So here is my um, Canvas dashboard, and we'll jump into the topics course in political science that is, um, the topic is democratic ideas. You can see there that I have a teaching assistant, but my department is increasingly moving towards having non-section TAs, which means that we have teaching assistants who can come and help out in the classroom and work on grading, so they're more than just a grader because they're there in the classroom with you and they hold office hours, but they don't hold weekly discussion sections. So uh, this is a class that ended up with an enrollment of 52, 55 if you count the senior auditors. Um, in the past, that would have been a class with one weekly 50-minute discussion section in addition to the 150 minutes of lecture each week. But my TA, Bree, is not holding discussion sections this term. That creates something of a challenge given the, given the learning objectives for the course, um, which uh, focus on things, of course, that the students are going to be able to do when they lead the course. That means that my learning objectives really aren't about transmitting content. They're about getting students to do things that will build skills that they can take away um, after they leave the course. So for instance, um, the ones I really focus on are numbers four and five for the purposes of thinking about online discussion. I want students to be able to articulate and defend their own understanding of democracy and I want them to be able to apply their knowledge of different understandings of democracy, including their own, to contemporary politics, particularly in the United States. Those are hard to do or hard to have students practice in a class of 52. And I'm going to talk about how I try to do that in uh, the face-to-face -face sessions in a bit. But um, I really want some kind of small group discussion if the students are going to practice those skills. And that's where I've been turning to online discussions through uh, the course of the term. The online discussions end up 
um, counting for not quite 25% of the overall course grade. So there's an online discussion each week. So 15 online discussions that are worth up to three points each for 45 points out of a total of 200 points for the term. So I'm giving students a fairly substantial portion of their grade for participating in the online discussions, though each week's discussion is pretty low stakes for them, right? Just three out of 200 points each week. Um, the online discussions, they are weekly. The class meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, sometime either Wednesday night or during the day on Thursday, I will publish the discussion prompt for the week. Students have to go in and make an initial post by the end of the day Friday, and then they have to go in and post a response uh, to at least one teammate, and I'll show you details of that. They have to do that by the end of the day Sunday. So I'm having them do this online discussion um, in small groups online uh, between the Thursday class and the Tuesday class each week. Do you um, change around the groups? Do I change around the groups? Yeah, like shuffle them. I do. I shuffle. Yeah. I, I'll talk a little bit more about this. I'll tell you when I shuffle them and why I have to shuffle them more because that's a kind of, for me, on the fly decision as the course goes along, as I'm seeing what's going on in the groups. Um, I'll show you the first week's discussion. So this happened after two class sessions in January. Um, First thing is you can see I've got the students in 10 discussion groups, so that means each discussion group has five or six students in it. Um, I use the groups function on Canvas to just randomly assign groups, especially at the beginning of the term, because um, I don't know the students and I don't really have a particular stake in who's in what's, what group, so I prefer the random assignment. Canvas takes care of that quite easily. It creates my group category discussion group, and that allows me when I go in and create the assignment in the discussion assignment in Canvas just to say this is a group assignment and we're going to use the category discussion groups. The prompt for this first week is very straightforward. I'm not, well I guess I am asking them to do a little bit of content, but I'm laying at, out here three things that I want them to do in their initial post. Um, I want them to introduce themselves, something about where they're from, um, what their name is. Um, I give them one just sort of icebreaker thing. Either tell the team who your favorite historical figure is or tell the team who your favorite actor or actress is and why. So that's the first one is a little bit more relevant to course content, but if they want to choose actor or actress, great. Get all kinds of fascinating um, responses here, of course, and this is the one students will respond to one another on the best at, the, at first, right? Because it's easy for them to go in and it's pretty non-threatening to go in and say, hey, I like Leo DiCaprio too. I, that might just have dated me. Um, but not as bad as some things could. And then finally, offer your own preliminary one-sentence definition of democracy and explain whether you think according to that definition the U.S. is a democracy or not. So trying to get them to engage with course material and already in the first discussion, trying to get them to put themselves out there a bit and say, here's what I think democracy is going in. Um, then everybody just goes in response to a teammate, uh, to at least one teammate uh, by 11.59 on Sunday. This is, um, I would think of this as a structured discussion, but not a particularly highly structured discussion. I'm not doing what bad, what unsuccessful online discussions tend to do, which is say, talk about the material for this week. Share something you want to share. It can't be open-ended like that. I just think you have to give them some specific task to do, and then they'll do it, and then they'll respond to one another. Um, I also put right here in the discussion prompt um, a breakdown of what grades will look like. Um, really, if you've written a uh, a quality post and a quality response, you're going to get three. The overwhelming majority of students who um, respond, who participate in the discussion at all, are going to get three points, right? Um, two points if you've written uh, an initial post in a discussion, but one of them doesn't show signs of much effort. That's the category that just lets me say, hey, step it up a notch. You can't just come in and post twice. You've got to do something. One, if you've written only an initial post or a reply to a teammate, this happens some, not a lot. Again, most students are getting threes on these most weeks. Um, sometimes you'll, of course, get a student who can get in there and do the original post, but over the weekend they just don't get a reply posted. Um, and then zero if they haven't participated at all. So that's what the discussion looks like, uh, a basic first discussion. Jump back and I'll show you one that's a little bit more substantive. So if we go down 
to discussion four. And this is all in instructor view. I would guess that in the activity after I stop talking, we'll have a chance to look in student view as well. So here's the fourth discussion week. This is a week where we read some early modern social contract theory, the emergence of popular sovereignty. We talked about consent. That Thursday in class, I know this is probably small for you, but I had talked about John Locke on express or tacit consent, and then I had kind of laid out the idea of hypothetical consent, which is a more contemporary way of thinking about the nature of consent and political legitimacy. And so this discussion post is really asking them to take that little bit that I've given them about hypothetical consent in class on Thursday and push forward with it, right? Um, apply the notion of hypothetical consent to contemporary politics. Talk about one example in your initial post that, where you think there's a government action that passes the test of hypothetical consent, one where you think there's a government action that fails the test of hypothetical consent, and then reflect a little bit on um, the very idea of hypothetical consent. Um, in general, and then again, post a response uh, to a teammate. I'll give you um, see if I can find some responses to just show you the kinds of things that students are. So we'll jump into group one here and see what they wrote. Um, this is not a, at all unusual when I give that kind of prompt for an initial post. I'm getting, in response to those three questions or three tasks that I've given them, I'm getting a solid paragraph for each one of those. This, for me, is a good first post for the week. I don't want them writing a lot more than that because I don't want to read more than that and their teammates won't write, read more than that. But if we scroll down, we'll see that some people will write a little bit more, a little bit less here as someone who's apparently very excited about their classmates' initial posts, right? Um, one of the things that's really wonderful, of course, is you get a lot of that. You get a lot of, hey, that was a great post. But there actually is, in the responses, there'll be a fair amount of criticism of one another. Um, and I, I got to say, honestly, this class is a particularly good class. They are... Um, really engaged with the substance and they're really talkative and kind to one another. And so the fact that they have really good online etiquette, I don't know the extent to which that's just this class. My experience, I would say, in general with this kind of online discussion, students today by and large know how to interact with one another in these online forms, especially if you say something at the beginning of, hey, let's be kind to one another online. They can disagree with one another and they do um, in pretty respectful ways. So that's what the online, that's what some of the responses look like. Again, that's pretty typical um, for the week, for a week's discussion. Um, let's see, we'll jump over here to speed grader. Um, I use the Canvas rubrics function to create a rubric, and that makes grading incredibly simple. So generally what I will do is on Monday morning, I'll set aside a little time on my calendar to grade the discussion for the previous week. Um, I go in and I read the posts by group. So I'll go back to that page I had up a minute ago and just read through the entire group's uh, initial posts and responses. And my rule is I will only post once per group per week. I do not try to go in and respond to each student personally. There's a couple reasons for that. The real one is that will kill me time-wise if I'm going in in a class of 50 and writing 50 responses every week. I'm, I'm going to end up not doing it or not doing it well. The other factor that I take into account is that if I'm in there and having a really prominent voice in the discussion, then I'm going to end up dominating the discussion and they're going to back off. And I would really rather it's their voices, not mine, in this context. So I try to keep myself fairly quiet, both for practical but also pedagogical reasons. So on each of these, you'll see me just putting in a little post at the end. Um, and then I'll switch over to speed grader, and I'll use speed grader to assign post points for the week. And that's a matter of putting the number of points here, clicking on the rubric to show them which um, category they're in. I'll be honest with you, about halfway through the term, I haven't always been putting the rubric on here because it's printed on the discussion prompt and they know what the story is, and almost all of them are getting threes every week anyway, which I'm perfectly happy to get those points out. Yeah. Okay, two questions yeah. actually now. Um, you said you comment on one post per week per student? No, one per week per group. 
One per week. Per so I jump in and put a, like a summary comment at the end of their discussion thread. Oh, okay. This is an individual student. But back on that previous page. Yeah, I, I've, I've yeah. always done that, like warn students that I might not get that involved at the beginning. I'll post prompts, yeah. and then I'll go through at the end and post a summary yeah. with like my teacher comments at the end. Yeah, but honestly, the other thing I would say is I'm not even putting that much in the way of comment. I'm putting a paragraph for myself. I'm not writing a bunch. What I'm often doing is kind of pulling together threads in what I see uh, in their, in their um, discussion. Uh, because of the nature of what I'm teaching and the kind of prompts I ask, there's not a right answer that I'm jumping in and providing at the end. I'm sort of, hey, this is what I see as common themes in what y'all are discussing this week. Yeah. Um, so. And my other question yeah. is with the rubric. <clears throat> so you said you, you stopped posting the rubrics. It, does Canvas allow you, if you've got a rubric, to just grab it and add it to anything? So, yep. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you go just up here. You didn't add it. Yeah, I, even I, though it's already built and in there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I've got. Okay. Yeah, it's just a matter of I didn't click. Okay, it's a few clicks away. Basically. It's it's yeah. right there, and I could do it. I mean, that's partly laziness on my part, in all honesty. It also partly I'm okay pedagogically with the fact that it's here right. on the prompt, right. and they can always see what a three means. In that way, so. I just didn't know if it was a whole process, and that's why. Yeah. It was just I use I okay. can use the same rubric every week once I have the, in fact I learned that after the first week, don't write a rubric that's specific to that discussion. Okay. Along similar lines of sort of time saving, um, all of this is basically the same every week. The little details here change in the bullet points, but I've got a lot of verbiage here that I just copy and paste from one week to the next. And all I have to do then is write an intro paragraph and put whatever bullet points I have here right, for each week. And that has made it very quick. So that is, I honestly, and this is a good example this week, I talked about something in class Thursday. I'm walking back to my office and I'm like, oh, that's what the discussion should be this week. I walk back to my office, I copy and paste the basic format from the week before and I alter this. Right? John, well, could, yeah. I don't know if you already said, but do you allow them to see they are post, the other post before they post their own, or they have to post their own first? I do allow them to do that. Um, so I think reasons that you wouldn't want them to do that, the big reason is they're just going to repeat what the other person says. And so there is that easy box to click on Canvas where you can say, um, don't let them post, don't let them read anything until they've posted their own. I haven't seen that problem. I can see it here and there around the edges where I'll come. You're being a little lazy with your definition of democracy. In general, I haven't seen that as a problem in this class because it's a really good class, so I haven't clicked it. Yeah. Do you think that's a product of more opinion-based rather than actual responses? I think so. I, I think so, yeah. And I think, and again, I'm trying to write exactly that, and I'm trying to write a prompt that they might actually be interested in talking about, too. Uh, and I'm just not concerned here about fact-based responses. I mean, I would prefer they're not just making stuff up. That sounds bad. <laughs> kind of contemporary. But, yeah. Have yeah. you ever used, um, this is a trick I've used with grad students, um, uh, assigning one of them to be the group leader and have them take a reading from the week and post the prompt, have them post the prompt instead of you? I'm going to hold on to that question until I jump into my okay. in, in my online uh, intro political thought course because I do something like that in yeah. that course. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, that's I, a sort of in my back pocket. It's been like, oh, I have that in my back pocket, that kind of prompt for this course. And I was just waiting for things to die down and not be good discussion-wise, and that never has happened in this course, so I just kept going with this. I, but the, the problem I've had with it is that um, it sort of locks you into, if you want to give them all a chance to be a leader, mm -hmm. you have to do that almost every week and mm -hmm. then it just gets really boring gets, for the discussion. That's right, that's right. Um, but yeah, I, I'll show you an example here in a minute. Um, I just want to quickly, before I leave this course, show a couple other things. So, um, someone ask about uh, do I mix up the groups? The answer is yes. I kind of randomly decided in week seven that I was going to scramble the groups even though things have been going well. 
So I scrambled the groups, and week seven, we're back to the exact same prompt from week one. Um, introduce yourselves to another, to one another again. This time, instead of laying out your own definition of democracy, it's briefly explain something interesting you've learned about democracy so far this term. That sounds like a complete throwaway prompt, and I was worried it might be. I got really interesting answers on this, and the other thing, I didn't intend it this way, but it was a kind of midterm check for me. What are they taking away, right? It was um, some good feedback in that way, and I didn't intend it that way, it just happened. Um, well, I'll show you, uh, I'm gonna show you, one. Oh, I'm gonna show you two more discussions uh, in this class. Which week do I need? Um, this is a week, uh, a couple weeks ago, where I had to be out of town on Thursday, so I didn't have class on Thursday. So here I want to use the discussion. I want to have them doing a little bit more work, and I want to bring some more content. So we have been talking about FDR and the ways in which he transforms contemporary notions of liberalism in America and democracy, and we had started developing possible critiques of that. And so Michael Sandel, the Harvard scholar, has a great um, TED talk where he's talking, the, the title is Why We Shouldn't Trust Markets With Our Civic Life. That doesn't sound like it would be against FDR, but it really is, because Sandel's really critical of FDR and New Deal liberalism. He thinks it uh, described Americans or framed Americans as consumers of politics in addition to consumers economically. And this plays right into this. So I have them here watch this video online. It's incredibly easy in uh, the Canvas discussion tool to plop a video in for them to watch. Um, so the idea here is that they would watch this, write a post, uh, it's up there somewhere, write a post about uh, their basic response to Sandel. Um, Actually, I make them do the one point in which you think he's correct, one way in which you think he's incorrect, and then your overall view. Mm -hmm. Wow, there were amazing posts here. And what's really cool about this is this lets me come back into the classroom the next Tuesday and say, sorry, we had to cancel class Thursday. I really liked what you said online. And I take a little extra time here in looking at the um, discussion responses to pull out some themes for me to then talk about in class that next Tuesday, which again is a very simple way for me to communicate to them that I took seriously what they did online. Um, one other thing I would say about, um, about this particular assignment is um, leading up to the, the Tuesday before they had to go do this assignment, we're talking about FDR in class, I end that class session with them in groups in class talking about the FDR speeches we've read. And for those groups, I all term have just had them get in their online discussion groups in the face-to-face -face sessions. So this is a classroom of, uh, it's one of the awful classrooms in social science where it's like an old style movie theater with no space and you can't move around. But I make them move around every day, basically. I have them getting in their groups from the online discussion sections in class. Right? And I actually think this is one thing that's worked really well to build some connections among the students in the classes, that they're interacting with one another online over the weekend, and in class on Tuesday, Thursday, I've got them working in those discussion groups face-to-face. Uh, -face. So they did some work on FDR, and then I said, this week online, you're gonna be talking about um, a video that's a critique of FDR. Final thing, this is this week's discussion coming up. Uh, this would be discussion 13. So this is a class on democratic ideas. I've got one student who is like the best first year student I think I've ever seen. Um, and um, this student is also taking a class on educational policy and theory and they're doing radical democratic education stuff. So it's a student who comes and pushes on me after class every day about what we're doing. So this student comes up to me and says, hey, for the final essay, you haven't passed out the prompt yet. What if we did it democratically and let the class come up with the final essay prompt? <laughs> and my TA and I are like, well, that's really interesting. And it also means we don't have to do that work. So sure. <laughs> so um, I had them get in their online discussion groups in class on Tuesday and do some first brainstorming about what they might think would be fun to write about for the final essay. And then um, here for the discussion this week, their initial post is going to be, discuss something you'd really like to write about for the final essay, offer a proposed essay prompt that will let you write about what you really want to write about, 
and then explain how that prompt fits with the syllabus statement about the final essay. Well, the syllabus statement just says the final essay will try to touch on all of these course learning outcomes, so I'm trying to get them to think on a metacognitive level about um, this final essay assignment and what the purpose of it is and how it fits into the course. So we'll see how this goes. We're going to get together next Tuesday in class and each group has to look back at what they've posted online and then have a final essay prompt to pitch to the class. We'll get class feedback and then the TA and I will probably take whatever the class says. We might tweak it a little. Um, so that's an overview of what I've been up to. This has been like the funnest course to teach because I love the content and the students are amazing. So, and I think the online discussion has had something to do with that. Let me just jump in quickly and show you um, the kind of essay prompt that I would use, that I have used in a fully online course in the summer. I think it's a little different task there because I don't have the chance to frame up the discussion activities in class and I don't have that opportunity to have them see one another face to face to meet those groups face to face. So this is purely online. Um, this is still, it's a sandbox because this is a work in progress still for this summer. Um, and I'm not as familiar with the navigation of this course. Um, for this online course I do a lot more highly structured uh, discussions. So we cover a series of what I call big political ideas. The second one after truth is happiness. Um, and uh, this isn't quite going to get the team leader, but I'll, I'll explain it. So here I am asking them to take on very specific roles in the online discussion. So we're going to talk about happiness. Um, Team member number one is going to be Plato, and they're going to say, say, here's someone in the contemporary world who Plato would think is happy, and here's why. Team member two is going to do the same thing, coming from the point of view of Machiavelli. Team member number three from Rousseau. Um, then people go in and respond, and then team member number five is a summarizer. They have to go in and write a summary post, and they say, here's what everybody said, and I think Plato's right. And then they go and they post one sentence summarizing their own summary on Padlet, which is an online bulletin board app that I use. And that lets each group have someone summarizing their weekly discussion on a bulletin board that's available to the whole class. That cuts down on my grading time as well, um, but it also is trying to get them to see that there's actually some collective product that comes from this, these discussion activities. This is what some weeks look like. Another thing that I will regularly do, and this goes to the kind of team leader thing, is sometimes team member number one's task will be to identify or to pick an issue that they're going to talk about that week. So pick an issue where you think, pick a contemporary political issue where you think the nature of justice is at stake. Explain why you think it's important, blah, blah, blah. And then other people will jump in and respond from the point of view of some thinker we've done. Um, I let students pick their own roles. I tell them at the beginning of the term, there's going to be roles every week, and it's up to you all to sort out who plays which role. What's really cool is then you see them in the first, this, at the first post of the first week's discussion will be, okay, who's going to be team member number one which week? They will sort it out themselves, and I just let them. And I don't, you know, there's going to be some people who are always going to be team member number five because they're just not going to get in the discussion form, but that's part of the flexible, manage your own time in an online course. So you don't force them to switch their roles. So if they wanted to be Plato the whole semester, they could be Plato. And I vary things enough that it's going to be hard for them to do that. Because okay. we're talking about different thinkers each week. Like Plato will appear in three or four different discussions over the course of the eight week term. So they're invariably going to play different roles. So it's more based on the deadline. Like if you get one really hyper student who always wants to be the first one posting yeah. Yeah, yeah. I ask them to switch around, and they basically play by the rules and do, but I don't worry about it too much. So, that's what I've done with online discussions. Awesome. <laughs>